Tonight, a tale of two chases. So which side is telling the truth? A spokesperson for Prince Harry and Meghan Markle saying the couple was involved in a near catastrophic car chase with paparazzi for two hours after leaving a charity event in New York. But law enforcement saying the couple was followed, not chased, describing the incident as chaotic, but not catastrophic. Even the mayor playing it down with the taxi driver who eventually picked up the royals. That's right, they were in a taxi. What he told our Gabe Gutierrez about the pursuit and the painful memories of Prince Princess Diana's death in a Paris chase that this is bringing back to life. This just in, George Santos heckled on the steps of the Capitol by another congressman right in front of our cameras. What led to the exchange as a battle is brewing in the House of Representatives over the embattled lawmaker charged with fraud and money laundering. Democrats moving to expel him from the chamber. What Republican leadership just did to avoid sending that resolution to a vote. The live report from the Hill coming up. Abortion pill battle, a federal court weighing whether to keep a commonly used abortion abortion drug on the market or uphold a lower court's decision to invalidate its FDA approval. How the Republican appointed judges appear to be leaning as North Carolina becomes the latest state to put major restrictions on abortion access. Apple secrets stolen, a rare security breach at the highly protective tech giant. A former employee charged with stealing top secret self-driving technology, then turning it over to a Chinese company where authorities believe that suspect is now hiding out. Overseas, a deadly flood disaster unfolding in Italy. At least eight people killed, 5,000 people evacuated, and the hugely popular Formula One event that organizers were forced to cancel. Plus, slingshot savior, a 13-year-old boy rescuing his sister from a potential kidnapper by firing a slingshot from his window. Tonight, you'll hear from that hero brother. And a court case that has become the taco of the town. Why Taco Bell is suing a regional Mexican chain over the phrase Taco Tuesday. Top story starts right now. And good evening. They are one of the most photographed couples in the entire world. But tonight, questions are swirling around Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and what exactly happened on the streets of New York City just last night and why there's so little video evidence of what went down. So let's take a look, because tonight there are a lot of questions. Here's what we know, right? Around 10 p.m., the Sussexes were spotted leaving a charity event in Midtown Manhattan. You see them here. You see all the flash bulbs going off there. We're making accepted an award from the Miss Foundation of Women. Now, you can see a swarm of photographers there to take their pictures. But from there, two different narratives have emerged, right? A spokesperson for Harry and Meghan saying after they left, they were involved in a, quote, catastrophic car chase, right, at the hands of a ring of highly aggressive paparazzi. But the NYPD, while acknowledging some sort of pursuit happened, saying in a statement that there were no reported collisions, summonses, injuries, or arrests in that regard. There are also no photos or videos of this chase so far. But all of this, of course, conjuring up images of that fatal car crash in a Paris tunnel in 1997 that killed Prince Harry's mother, Princess Diana. And that image, of course, of Harry walking behind his mother's casket. Who could ever forget this, right? All burned in our minds. The trauma of that tragedy is something Harry says he still carries with him as an adult. Keir Simmons will have much more on Harry's complicated relationship with the press in a moment. But tonight, we start off with Gabe Gutierrez, who's live in New York. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan Markle seen here leaving a charity event in New York. And tonight there appear to be differing accounts about what happened next. A spokesperson for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex admonishing photographers for a relentless pursuit that lasted two hours and resulted in multiple near collisions involving other drivers on the road, pedestrians and two NYPD officers. Adding, the near catastrophic car chase came at the hands of a ring of highly aggressive paparazzi. The briefing I received, uh, you know, two of our officers could have been injured. I thought that was a bit reckless and irresponsible. Though tonight, at least three law enforcement sources tell NBC News the couple was followed, not chased, and that the incident was a bit chaotic, not near catastrophic. I would find it hard to believe that there was a two-hour high-speed chase. 
In a written statement, the NYPD says numerous photographers made the couple's transport challenging, but there were no reported collisions, injuries, or arrests. Harry and Megan had private security as they left this venue, and two law enforcement sources tell NBC News that they wanted to return to Manhattan's Upper East Side, where they were staying with a friend and did not want the paparazzi to follow. So the law enforcement sources say the couple was driven up and down Manhattan for more than an hour with a police escort. Then the pair was taken to this police precinct where a taxi picked them up. Would you describe it as chaotic? Yeah, chaotic. You could say chaotic. But yeah. With me, I don't know what happened previous in the day, right? right? Mm -hmm. With me, it was chaotic, but not crazy, crazy, right? Do you think the paparazzi went too far? Ah, uh, you know, I don't know. When we were there, they kept their distance when they were following us in my cab. Sonny Singh told us he's the taxi driver who picked up the couple, but he says they drove around for only 10 minutes before the street was blocked by a garbage truck. People just came out of nowhere with cameras and started snapping pictures. Did they seem worried? They seem worried. They seem worried and nervous as well. He then says he dropped them back off at the police precinct where a different car eventually took them home. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now live from Manhattan. Gabe, we heard there from the cab driver who drove Harry and Megan. Felt like they were worried. What, what more did he tell you about the time that they spent in his cab? Well, Tom, it was incredible to hear from this cab driver again. He says he only drove them for about 10 minutes. And just so we're clear on the timeline here, this cab driver picked them up when they were at the police precinct and then started driving them around again for 10 minutes. He says a garbage truck blocked the road. And that's when he says this crush of cameras surrounded the vehicle. He was very careful, though, in his language. He said, while it may be chaotic, it wasn't really that crazy. And so he did say that they seemed very worried, Tom. And he then eventually drove them back a few minutes later to this police precinct. And then they found another vehicle that eventually got them safely back to the Upper East Side, Tom. Even with that, Gabe, it seems there's still a lot of daylight between what the, the Harry and Megan are saying, the Sussexes are saying, versus what the NYPD and the mayor are saying. Do we know why there's such a such a stretch there? Well, certainly it, it goes back to their vantage point, right? The uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have waged this battle with the press. They've been traumatized, they say, by intense media scrutiny before. So from their perspective, it may be that uh, paparazzi went too far. Speaking with this cab driver, though, he said he was used to it. By the way, he says that he's picked up other celebrities before. He didn't really seem that very much phased by it, Tom. But the question is, that's a central question. Did the paparazzi here go too far? The NYPD says there were no arrests, however, and as you said in your introduction, the a source close to Harry and Meghan does say security video exists of this incident, but it hasn't been released publicly yet, and, Tom. And Gabe, before you go, because some people may be sort of confused by the mayor's statements, you live in New York City, you, you report out of New York City, you're a man about town. What, why would a two-hour car chase in New York City be almost impossible, especially in Manhattan? Of course. This... Right. And you heard there from Mayor Adams, a high speed chase in New York City, even at that time of night, is nearly impossible. You see how tight these streets are. There's, it's extremely crowded. There's a lot of traffic even at that time. Even if they went on the FDR just in the fringe of Manhattan and made it to a highway to go there for two hours, it's a very long period of time. Those uh, law enforcement sources say that they did drive around for more than an hour, but it's a question whether this really was a high-speed chase or whether it was a chaotic scrum of photographers that made uh, Harry and Meghan very uncomfortable, perhaps. All right, Tom? Gabe Gutierrez, leading us off. Gabe, we appreciate all your reporting. And with all of that said, we know that Harry has fought the paparazzi fiercely, right? The news today reminding many of Princess Diana's 1997 tragic death in a car crash while being chased by paparazzi. NBC's Keir Simmons has more from London tonight on Harry's painful past. It is a highly charged combination. Prince Harry, his wife and his mother-in-law, the paparazzi and all the painful memories of his mum. Princess Diana spent her adult life endlessly trying to evade unwelcome cameras. It was the primary cause of her fatal car crash in a Paris tunnel. Whatever exactly happened in New York on Tuesday night, her son appears to have been trying to do the same. Escape photographers. In his book this year, he described driving to the place where Diana died. I thought driving the tunnel would bring an end or brief cessation to the pain, the decade of unrelenting pain. Instead, it brought on the start of pain 
Today, together with Meghan, he is locked in a battle with the press that has already contributed to their rift with the royal family. Prince Harry is set to give evidence in a court case that accuses British newspapers and journalists of hacking cell phones of royals and those around them, even the king. But followed by photographers in a big city, Prince Harry will have been on a hair trigger. The past is never dead, reads the quote that opens his autobiography. It's not even the past. On Tuesday night, he may have felt that was never more true. Right, and with that, Keir joins us tonight from London. Keir, I want to take a look at some of the headlines from the UK, right? And it seems like the media, at least for now, there where you are in London, is buying the story that Harry and Meghan's spokesperson told this morning here in the US. I guess the question I have, and we were talking to Gabe about this earlier, there's two different statements, right? Harry and Meghan saying it was catastrophic, possibly, potentially, and the NYPD saying, well, it wasn't that bad, but it was definitely chaotic. H how are the people in the UK perceiving this news or, or do they even care? Well, Tom, stand by for it to descend in the same, to the same kind of polarised he said, she said, taking sides that we've seen swirling around Harry and Meghan uh, for the past months and uh, years. Look, I, I think the issue here may be uh, perception. Uh, clearly, uh, Harry is going to be uh, thinking about his mum, as we said in, in the report, and there are some parallels. His mum was trying to escape and evade the paparazzi when she died. Prince Harry clearly was trying to get away away from the paparazzi. His mum uh, had private security, not royal protection. Prince Harry now has private security, not royal protection. But then again, there's also uh, that context, that battle with that media, that uh, legal fight that he has now taken to court here in, in London, Tom, uh, with the, the British uh, press. This isn't just about the past for Prince Harry. I think it's about the future. He seems determined to fight the media. Uh, whether or not he can win, well, that's a, something that many people would you question? Well, there is a report, uh, Tom, that Prince Harry was filming. Uh, will we see that footage soon in order to kind of, you know, corroborate his, uh, his view, or will he hold it back for some kind of a documentary? What impact will uh, that have on people's perception of what this is uh, really all about? But then uh, I think there is some uh, m management, if you like, or, or message management going on here, but maybe in a way that you don't expect. So here's what happens, or what has happened here in the UK over the years, Tom. The royals, when they have been packed, when they've been chased by the paparazzi, have sent out a message saying that it's happened. And their uh, ambition there has been to tell the media not to use the photos. Why? Because then the paparazzi don't get paid. And the hope by Buckingham Palace and the royals here has been that you interrupt the economy of the paparazzi and, and basically try and uh, stop them from doing it again. Maybe that's what Prince Harry was thinking of here. The question again, though, is how come such, such hyperbolic language when it doesn't look as if it exactly fits what really went on. Keir, that is the type of perspective we could only get from someone who has covered the Royals for a long time, and it's one of the great reasons that we're so lucky to have you tonight. Keir, we appreciate all your reporting. Thank you. Okay, we head to Washington now, where we have some developing news that just happened. There is a push by House Democrats to expel and battle Republican Congressman George Santos. The GOP-led House bypassing a vote on a resolution to expel Santos from Congress instead referring it over to the Ethics Committee. But just moments ago, Santos walked to the east steps of the Capitol with some dramatic words and then was heckled by a fellow congressman. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles was in the middle of all of it. Ryan joins us now live here on Top Story. So, Ryan, you were right there for that sort of impromptu news conference. Walk us through what happened next. You know, Tom, it seems as though uh, from his first day in Congress, uh, chaos follows George Santos everywhere he goes. And today was no different. And, and this came just after uh, the House of Representatives voted to refer uh, this matter of expelling him from Congress to the House Ethics Committee. And Santos came to the steps to talk to members uh, of the media about his perspective on that. What Santos basically said is that he was glad that his fellow Republicans um, uh, offered this up to the Ethics Committee so that he could have due process, so that he could make his case to his fellow members of Congress, that he is innocent of the charges against him. And in the midst of that conversation, while he was explaining himself uh, to those of us in the press corps, another member of Congress, uh, Jamal Bowman, also of New York, came by and just started yelling at Santos, telling him to resign. Here's a bit of that exchange. I'm confident that I will fight to clear my name. So, why do you deserve another term in Congress, sir? They wouldn't have voted today had they had the vote. 
Like I said, if, if I could, if I could understand you over my colleagues screaming here, the reality is, is So you can hear part of what Bowman said there. He said, uh, have some dignity. It's time for you to step down. Uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was also with Bowman at the time. She actually serves on the ethics committee. Uh, you know, of course, uh, there's always a lot of drama when it uh, relates to George Santos, Tom. The sum total of all of this is that the ethics committee is now the ones that are going to be responsible for deciding the future of George Santos here in Congress. Uh, and whether or not they make the recommendation to expel him is something that we still are going to have to wait and see. Okay, well, but, but I got to ask you, Ryan, you know, Democrats introduced this resolution yesterday. It gets kicked over to the Ethics Committee as you're talking there. Do you see a scenario where that GOP-led Ethics Committee votes to expel Santos? Yeah, I think it is still a very real possibility, Tom. You know, there are a number of Republicans, many of them from New York, uh, who have joined the chorus of Democrats telling George Santos that it's time to resign. Now, those same Republicans also believe that it shouldn't be Congress that necessarily expels him without that due process part of it that comes through the Ethics Committee investigation. So that's why they're asking for this process to play itself out. But if the Ethics Committee d is able to uncover or deliver enough hard evidence that shows that he is responsible or guilty of many of the things that he's been accused of, it's very possible uh, that Republicans will join Democrats. He needs two-thirds of the House to vote to expel him. So that is very possible. I, the question I have, Tom, is it does it not come until we're closer to the next election and where Republicans have found a candidate that could win a race in his district, which is a very close district? That may be the calculation for Republicans right now. So this is still a very, po a very real possibility. It's just not going to happen immediately. Yeah, more than a year away, though. That's a long time. Okay, Ryan, we appreciate that. Thank you for all of it. Now to the ongoing battle over abortion. A federal appeals court hearing arguments on limiting access nationwide to a widely used abortion pill, a fight ultimately heading back to the Supreme Supreme Court, while some states restrict abortion further. Here's Laura Jarrett. Tonight, the most commonly used abortion pill still on the market, but its legal future uncertain. A federal appeals court appearing deeply skeptical today of arguments from the Biden administration and pill manufacturer as they try to keep Mifepristone available. I don't understand this thing. The FDA can do no wrong. We are allowed to look at the FDA just like we're allowed to look at any agency. The three-judge panel must decide what to do with that controversial decision out of Texas last month, which invalidated the FDA's longtime approval of the drug. One judge hearing the case appointed by George W. Bush, the other two by Donald Trump. All have a history of supporting abortion restrictions. Judge James Ho calling abortion a moral tragedy in a 2018 case. The stakes of what happens to a pill women can currently get in the mail even higher now with new abortion restrictions emerging at the state level. We needed to take action uh, to protect the unborn. Overnight in North Carolina, a GOP supermajority banned most abortions after 12 weeks with few exceptions, overriding the governor's veto. The law is incredibly arbitrary and it was crafted uh, by people who are not physicians. It's really important to note that when there's a list of exceptions, someone is always left out. North Carolina had been an outlier among a sea of states that restricted access after the Supreme Court decided women don't have a constitutional right to an abortion. Every pregnancy threatens the life of mothers. In neighboring South Carolina, a six-week ban like Florida's on the horizon. Okay, Laura Jarrett joins us now live in studio. So, Laura, I guess my first question, want, I want to go back to that abortion mm -hmm. pill. What's your sense of those judges and the ruling on the FDA pill and the most widely used abortion pill? What do you think is going to happen? Oh, this pill is in real trouble. It's clear from the questioning today, over about two hours, uh, the Biden administration, the pill manufacturer who want to keep the drug on the market, pet for uh, just uh, time and again by all of these judges, all three of these judges, will see exactly how they frame the opinion. And remember, even no matter what they do. This is going back up to the Supreme Court, but it matters because it will just affect how the Supreme Court actually views the case, views the issues. Essentially, they tee it up for the Supreme Court. But as of right now, pill stays on the market. It's all just going back to the Supreme Court. And then back to North Carolina. North Carolina is not the only state we're tracking, right? We're also talking about Nebraska and something may happen there as well. Yeah, Nebraska actually wanted a 
six-week ban, I believe, but they didn't get it. And so now it looks like a 12-week ban uh, is where they're headed. That seems to be, uh, you know, the new course of action for, obviously, North Carolina and Nebraska. Uh, South Carolina tried the six-week ban. It, it, the, the line keeps creeping further and further. Remember, many women don't know they're pregnant until much, much later. Um, but, again, this is what happens after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Okay, Laura Jared, who's been very busy the past couple of weeks. Laura, we always appreciate it. Thank you. We do want to head overseas now to Italy and the deadly flooding that has devastated the northern part of the country. The images are wild. Torrential rain submerging entire communities and forcing thousands more to evacuate. Ali Ruzzi has this one for us. Tonight, northern Italy in a deadly disaster. Record flooding, killing at least eight people with fears that number could rise with more missing. Firefighters now desperately trying to rescue survivors, using helicopters to pull stranded residents to safety. Torrential rains in the Emilia-Romagna region causing all the rivers in the area to overflow, flooding 23 cities. The catastrophic conditions triggering the evacuation of more than 5,000 people. Entire bridges have been washed away as rushing waters wreak havoc on the infrastructure, destroying homes and submerging thousands of acres of farmland. Officials say some parts of the region received half of their average annual rainfall in just 36 hours. The intense flooding even leading to the cancellation of the highly anticipated Formula One Grand Prix set to take place in the area this weekend. This food and beverage service worker saying that, unfortunately, the situation has changed dramatically. It's a critical situation, and it's been decided to postpone the Grand Prix until a later date. Northern Italy becoming all too familiar with weather extremes, swinging from drought to deluge. The Italian government now sounding the alarm as the country deals with the devastating effects of climate change. In Emilia-Romagna, Italy's civil protection minister saying what happened in Emilia-Romagna had already happened with different effects in Ischia and could happen anywhere else in the country. With more rain expected to batter the area, authorities warn residents it's not over, urging people to get to higher ground amid fears the rain-swollen rivers could burst their banks again. And Tom, Italy is no stranger to these climate extremes. Last year, Italian authorities declared a state of emergency due to severe drought in the same area that experienced this torrential rain. Now the World Meteorological Organization says that temperatures in Europe increased at more than twice the global average over the past 30 years, the highest increase of any continent. Scientists warn that unless meaningful action is taken to mitigate climate change, Europe will continue to see more intense and frequent weather cycles. Tom? Okay, Ali Aruzzi for us. Ali, we appreciate it. But back here at home, we want to head to California, where federal prosecutors say an ex-Apple employee took the company's trade secrets back to China. The Chinese national is now believed to be an executive at a self-driving car company based in China. The charge is part of a broader effort at the Department of Justice, where there's growing concern over stolen property information from American companies. Dana Griffin has the details. Tonight, a former Apple employee charged with stealing trade secrets for self-driving cars, then fleeing to China, and he's still at large. uh... This YouTube video appears to show the man testing a Jadu self-driving vehicle. He's named in the video as the head of autonomous driving at the Chinese electric vehicle company. Stealing software and hardware source code from U.S. tech companies in order to market it to Chinese competitors. According to the newly unsealed indictment, 35-year-old Wei Bao Wang was hired by Apple in 2016 and attended secrecy training for the project he was working on. Then, nearly two years after gaining access to Apple's highly sensitive materials, he accepted a U.S.-based job with an unnamed Chinese company, but didn't resign from Apple until four months later, the indictment says. Baidu, the massive Chinese internet company that owns Jadu, did not respond to our request for comment. According to the indictment, law enforcement executed a search warrant at Wang's Mountain View, California home in June of 2018. Among the materials discovered from the devices in Wang's home was the source code for Apple's entire autonomous systems project as it existed around the time 
that Wang left Apple. Open the door, uh, FBI open up. If you don't open up the door, we will. This Bay Area family remembers that day Wang's home was raided. So we ran to the, the peephole and I could see all the way up these stairs, uh, just FBI agents on full, full gear. Wang was home during the raid according to the indictment, but managed to board a one-way flight from San Francisco to China later that same night. The DOJ did not comment on Wang's current location, but confirmed he is not in custody. You'll never be able to stop this kind of thing from happening 100%. Even with Big Brother, you know, with all kind of keylogging software, even a photo can get around keylogging software. If I took a picture of some source code, um, that is not typing anything into my keyboard. There's always a workaround. Wang's indictment is just one of five announced Tuesday by the DOJ's newly formed Disruptive Technology Task Force. We stand vigilant in enforcing U.S. laws to stop the flow of sensitive technologies to our foreign adversaries. Apple has not responded to NBC's request for comment. U.S. companies now on high alert as the government fights an emerging threat. All right, Dana Griffin joins us now live from Los Angeles. Dana, great to see you tonight. The only way the U.S. or Apple will get justice here, right, is with the help of China. What are the chances China will actually help out in this case? Well, Tom, according to our legal experts, it's very unlikely. Now, there is no extradition treaty with China. So unless China has some political gain to turn him over, they probably won't. And this issue is bigger than Wang. There are other former Apple employees from China accused of stealing trade secrets. One pleaded guilty in August. Another is also facing charges. But a trial date for his case has yet to be set. If convicted, Wang faces up to 10 years in prison for each trade secret violation. Tom. All right, Dana Griffin for us. Dana, we appreciate all of that. Still ahead tonight, the small plane crash in Florida, a banner plane. You see them all the time there in Florida going down near a Target parking lot. Look what happened. It burst into flames. What we've just learned about the plane company involved. Plus, slingshot savior. This is an incredible story you're going to love. A 13-year-old brother witnessing a kidnapping attempt on his younger sister. How he used his slingshot to stop the crime. You'll hear directly from him. And Taco Wars, the new legal battle over the phrase Taco Tuesday. Yes, it's going to court. Can you believe that? We'll explain. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Wednesday. We're back now with new developments in the brutal killings of those four University of Idaho students. The suspect has been indicted and is expected to be back in court very soon, where we should learn more about what happened. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin has this. Tonight in Moscow, Idaho, Brian Koberger, the man charged with stabbing four college students to death, now indicted by a grand jury. The indictment includes four counts of murder in the first degree and one count of burglary. If found guilty, he could be sentenced to death. Koberger has yet to enter a plea, but his previous attorney said he believes he'll be exonerated. The indictment follows his December arrest at his family home in Pennsylvania. More than 45 days after Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin were found brutally murdered in this college house. According to court documents, Koberger's DNA was found on a knife sheath at the crime scene. And his white Hyundai Elantra seen driving here during a routine traffic stop was also allegedly caught on camera in the area the night of the killings. One of two surviving roommates telling police she saw a male figure with bushy eyebrows, a mask and black clothing in the home that night. So this grand jury indictment simplifies the process for the surviving witnesses. Absolutely, because they don't have to testify in front of Koberger during this preliminary proceeding. News of the indictment is the latest twist in a grisly case that's left a small university community heartbroken. <laughs> Last weekend, Kaylee and Maddie both received posthumous degrees. Koberger will be arraigned on Monday. Legal experts say once he enters a plea, the trial must begin within six months unless he waives his right to a speedy trial. Tom. Aaron McLaughlin for us tonight. Aaron, we appreciate that. We want to switch gears now to an incredible and, and somewhat uplifting story. A 13-year-old shares how he saved his 8-year-old sister using a slingshot to fend off a would-be kidnapper. NBC Stephen Romo spoke to the family about the boy's quick-thinking action. Tonight, a 13-year-old boy being hailed a hero after police say he saved his little sister from a kidnapping using a slingshot. So I was in the room. Right, playing games like all, all, all the teenage boys do. And 
I hear my sister scream. Owen Burns tells us he looked out his window only to see his eight-year-old sister being grabbed by a stranger. He knew he had to act fast. I had two things I shot him with, head and chest. Head was the marble, the chest was the rock. Through the window, making the shot twice from about 200 feet away, according to his mother. Seems like you're a pretty good shot. Do you practice a lot with your sink shot? No, not at all slightest. What was going through your mind when this happened, when you saw this guy coming to your sister? I was mad, so I got out outside. Well, it's maybe a little bad. Police say the little girl had been playing in her backyard when the man appeared. The suspect had come through the woods onto her property and came from behind her, grabbed her like like you'd see in the movies, hand over the mouth, arm around the waist, and was attempting to pull her into the woods. Police say troopers were able to find the 17-year-old suspect hiding at a nearby gas station, easily identified thanks to Owen. What he did also helped us to identify who the suspect was because obviously he had injuries from getting hit with a slingshot and those were things that helped us evidentiary wise. Police sharing with their mother Margaret that her son is in fact a perfect shot. I kind of thought he was lying but then when the police finally confirmed it and said that he did hit him twice and he did make both shots I was quite impressed. He really is the one that um, that saved that I believe saved his sister's either life or from something seriously bad happening to her. Now the Burns family healing from the traumatic event, one that could have ended much differently. We're just happy we were able to celebrate her eighth birthday that Saturday after. I mean, we could have been celebrating a funeral or something else. And Owen has some advice for parents. You always want to tell them if you have 13 year old, better buy them a slingshot. All right, definitely advice from a 13 year old. Stephen Romo joins us now live in studio. When you hear that mother's chilling words, it sort of brings everything into perspective because it's 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 a different type of story. What do we know about this suspect? Yeah, the suspect actually is just 17 years old. We know that he will be tried as an adult. His bond was set at $150,000 at his arraignment last week with three charges, one for attempted kidnapping, one for attempted assault, and one for assault and battery. Meanwhile, that mom we heard from in that story was so terrified at the time yeah. she raced home, now says this little girl just wants to move on and forget about it. But it kind of sounds like this young man may have some endorsement deals with slingshots coming up in his future, trying oh, to get yeah. other parents to buy them out there. That or enter some kind of competition. So, all right, Steve. Stephen Romo, we thank you for that. When we come back, cops miss robbers. This is crazy. Surveillance video showing a couple of thieves ransacking a clothing store. The moment not one, but two police cars drove by without noticing the crime in progress. And late breaking news on TikTok, which U.S. state just became the first to ban the popular social media app? That's right. TikTok banned completely in one state. We'll tell you. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a deadly plane crash in Hollywood, Florida. Social media video showing a small plane engulfed in flames in the middle of a roadway. Aerial footage capturing crews responding, spraying foam onto that burned wreckage. One person on board was killed. No one else, though, was hurt. NBC Miami found the company was linked to five crashes and emergency landings from 2014 to 2019. An investigation is now underway after Sacramento police missed a burglary in progress, not once, but twice. New surveillance video showing two suspects breaking into a clothing store, you see it here, and then dropping their tools as a police car drives by. A second police car passes by moments later. The store owner saying the burglar stole at least $30,000 worth of merchandise, and authorities did not respond until 10 minutes after the incident. Montana, this is big news, officially banning TikTok, the first U.S. state to do so. The governor signing a bill into law that will prohibit app stores from offering TikTok within Montana state limits. The governor saying the ban is in an effort to protect people's personal data. It doesn't go into effect until January 1st, 2024. TikTok has vowed to fight it. This all comes amid growing calls from U.S. lawmakers to ban the Chinese-owned app nationwide over privacy concerns. And two taco restaurant chains battling it out over Taco Tuesday. Taco Bell filing a petition with the U.S. Trademarks Office to reverse Wyoming-based 
Taco John's trademark of the phrase Taco Tuesday. Taco Bell arguing it should be able to use that phrase without legal consequences, going so far as to say the trademark violates the American ideal of the pursuit of happiness. Taco John's response, it's rolling out a two-week-long Taco Tuesday deal. All right, the taco wars are on. Okay, now to the Americas and the chaos engulfing Ecuador's government tonight. The president there dissolving the country's National Assembly to stop his own impeachment. Valerie Castro has this story. Tonight, political turmoil in Ecuador and what could be the end of one of the last remaining conservative leaders in Latin America. <laughs> the country's president, Guillermo Lasso, terminating the impeachment proceedings against him with a drastic measure, dissolving the National Assembly. <laughs> decidido aplicar el artículo 148 de la Constitución de la República que me otorga la facultad de disolver la Asamblea Nacional por grave crisis política y conmoción interna. National Police now prohibiting former Assembly members from entering the legislative building. The constitutional tool dubbed La Muerte Cruzada, which translates to a two-way death, also effectively ending Lasso's own presidency in six months. He would have had to govern two more years as an exceptionally weak president with um, several scandals swirling around his government related to possible corruption, to possible crime ties. This was not an easy position to be in. Lasso forced into the lose-lose situation, facing impeachment over accusations of embezzlement related to an oil shipping contract before he took office. Los acusadores se han obsesionado por acabar con mi gobierno. The latest political strife for Lasso comes amidst brutally low approval ratings since the start of his presidency in 2021. A recent Perfiles de Opinión survey showing only 13 percent of Ecuadorians see Lasso in a positive light. What are some of the monumental, I guess, hills that he's had to overcome? Sure. I think monumental is the right word. Ecuador used to be a safe country. It used to have a national homicide rate lower than that of the United States. But last year, its homicide rate topped even that of Mexico's. Other domestic challenges erupting last June. Violent clashes between supporters of indigenous groups and police over the price of gasoline and food. Authorities deploying water cannons and tear gas. Lasso calling the demonstrations an attempted coup. Hacemos un llamado a la comunidad internacional para advertir de este intento de desestabilizar la democracia en el Ecuador. In January 2022, a broken oil pipeline causing an environmental disaster in the Ecuadorian rainforest and the nation beset by years of prison riots leaving hundreds of inmates dead. The future of the country now up to voters. No one expects right wing or center right parties to do well in these next elections. The more likely outcome is that this uh, development plays into the hands of Lasso's opponents, ironically, the populist left. Valerie Castro joins us now in studio. So, Valerie, I guess the next question is, will there be an election now in Ecuador? So, eventually. But for now, Lasso will continue to govern for the next six months by decree. And in the meantime, the National Electoral Council has seven days to call for elections for both the presidency and the assembly. Those elected will then serve out the remainder of the term, which ends on May 2025. So, Tom Lasso essentially cut out the remainder of his presidency, which was a year and a half. All right. Valerie Castro on a very important story. Valerie, thank you. Coming up, Global Watch and the amazing new view of the Titanic. Have you seen this? The first digital scans reveal unprecedented detail of the shipwreck like we have never seen before. What it may tell us about the disaster. Stay with us. All right, next tonight from the border, new numbers being reported on the amount of migrant encounters since the end of Title 42. This is the fallout over the end of the COVID era immigration policy impacts communities across the U.S. We are joined tonight here on Top Story by Blas Nunez Neto. He's the Assistant Secretary for Border and Immigration Policy at the Department of Homeland Security. Assistant Secretary, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know you spoke with reporters earlier today and you gave an update on the border. I want to put these numbers up for our viewers so they can see them. These are some of the trends that the administration finds are moving in a positive direction. First, encounters down by 56 percent since the days before Title 42 was lifted. 4.4 thousand daily encounters since May 12th. You remember, we were talking about numbers like 11,000 earlier last week. And CBP1, the app, processed 5,000 individuals since May 12th. 
So, Assistant Secretary, I want you to walk our viewers through why you think these numbers are positive so they understand. Sure. So the first thing I would say is that, you know, we view these signs as we view these as encouraging signs that the policies we have put in place, uh, policies that combine uh, strengthened consequences for individuals who cross the border uh, unlawfully, but also are combined with a, you know, substantially increased lawful pathways for individuals who are willing to wait and take a safe and orderly route to come to the United States. Uh, that these policies uh, are working as they were intended. Uh, we also uh, have been working quite closely with our foreign partners, with the government of Mexico, the government of Guatemala, and governments uh, in the region uh, to do more to address uh, these uh, migratory flows uh, before they reach uh, our border. I want to ask I you... caution, though, that these are still early days. Right. Uh, it's still just the first week, and, and you know, we're close to watching this. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. I, I want to understand, why, why does the administration think 5,000 migrants using the app, or at least registered through the app, is a good sign? Because like we said, right, we were talking about tens of thousands, close to 40,000. We don't have the total for last week. I'm not sure if we do yet or not. But when you compare that number to the 5,000 applying for asylum through the app, do you really see that as a positive sign? We, we believe that uh, providing non-citizens with the opportunity to take a safe and orderly route uh, to the United States if they wish to claim asylum uh, is something that the, this country, uh, you know, wants to do and, and should be doing. Uh, however, we believe there's a, a right way and a wrong way to come to the United States. Uh, the wrong way is obviously crossing unlawfully between ports of entry and, and there. You know, we are implementing our lawful pathways rules that places some common sense conditions on asylum eligibility for individuals who do not use the CBP-1 app. So uh, we do believe and are encouraged by the success uh, of the app, and we think it's a smart way to manage uh, flows to the border. Uh, Assistant Secretary, as you know, of course, the Border Patrol falls under the Department of Homeland Security. Last night, right here on Top Story, we had the Vice President of the National Border Patrol Council. Here's what he had to say. You know, when you're seeing a bunch of these agents that are having to be put in the processing centers, they're doing the job that, you know, they really didn't sign up for. And it's frustrating for them because when they're apprehending these individuals, these individuals themselves are letting them know, hey, look, we're coming across now. We know we're going to get released. And at the same time, they're, they're hearing, you know, radio traffic or sensor traffic, knowing that other groups are coming across, not knowing what those other groups are that are coming in other areas. What is your response there to Agent Del Cueto? And I guess his, his bigger question, or his bigger point, I should say, was, was about sort of Border Patrol being taxed, and then on top of that, the, the rapid release, if you will. Those, those are words that sources within the DHS has told to NBC News. Essentially, the processing of those ten, tens of thousands of immigrants and then them being released, many, of course, with court dates, but still being released into the streets of America. Well, there's little doubt that our 24,000 uh, men and women from Customs and Border Protection, from the Border Patrol and the Office of Field Operations, who have been uh, working on the front lines for the past uh, year uh, and a half, uh, as we've dealt with this uh, challenge on the border, have been doing heroic work. Uh, we have, over the last uh, few months, surged resources to support them. Uh, we have more than 1,000 law enforcement personnel from other parts of the department and the administration and other departments uh, deployed to the border, and obviously we have uh, are in the process of deploying uh, up to 1,500 active duty military personnel uh, to again uh, enhance and support uh, our men and women uh, on the front lines. Uh, I would also say that you know over the past uh, uh, week, as we have seen uh, again this encouraging decrease in uh, unlawful crossings at the land border that that has given our uh, uh, border patrol facilities a chance to decompress. And we are now, uh, you know, at substantially uh, lower levels of in-custody numbers uh, and below our, uh, you know, uh, custody limits uh, compared to where we were uh, even, uh, even a week ago. Assistant Secretary, do you think it was the right move to sort of rapidly release all of those migrants? Again, process them, take them in, vet them, give them a court date. But we were talking about tens of thousands of migrants who are now out on the streets of America and in many cases putting pressure on local governments who do not have the room to house them. 
So I would say a, a couple of things there. The first is that, as you noted, every individual we process is thoroughly vetted against our national security and public safety uh, systems. And any individual who could pose a threat to the community, you know, individuals with outstanding warrants or individuals who may have a link to terrorism uh, are detained and are, are not released. And I would also say that, you know, presidents of both parties have uh, at times had to release individuals uh, from custody in order to ensure the safety and well-being uh, of the migrants in our custody, but also of the uh, men and women uh, who work for U.S. Customs and, and Border Protection. And, you know, the last point I would make here is that uh, we appreciate and really understand uh, the costs that our communities are bearing uh, when it comes to uh, the challenge posed by uh, migration to the border. And, you know, we view those as the costs of a fundamentally broken system that the U.S. Congress uh, has not uh, updated in decades since a bill to the U.S. Congress on the first day of this administration. And we have been consistently calling for uh, our members of Congress to work on a bipartisan basis to deal with this challenge once and for all. Assistant Secretary, we appreciate your time. I know you're incredibly busy this week, last week, and I know you still have a lot of work to do ahead. So we thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you tonight. Now to top stories, Global Watch and the deadly attack against a U.S. convoy in Nigeria. The attackers opened fire in the Anambra state, one of the epicenters of separatist violence in that region, killing four people, including two U.S. embassy staffers and two policemen. Five people are still missing. The motive, though, is still unclear and remains under investigation. And tonight we have an update in that deadly hostile fire in New Zealand we first reported on Monday night right here on Top Story. Police are now saying they believe it was arson and they've launched a homicide investigation. The fire that you saw there tore through a hostel in the capital city of Wellington. At least six people killed and that death toll, though, is expected to rise with 20 people still unaccounted for. Police are now trying to identify any suspects. And now to the wreckage of the Titanic like we've never seen before. Researchers creating a 3D model, look at this, of the sunken ocean liner using 700,000 images shot by submersibles. The footage showing how far the wreckage has deteriorated, including the iconic grand staircase in ruins. Scientists say it's the largest underwater scanning project in history and could provide further insight into the 1912 disaster. Okay, when we come back, saved by the iPhone, a group of teenagers lost inside of a canyon at night. They didn't have cell service, but still managed to contact rescuers using their iPhone. One of those rescuers explaining the potentially life-saving technology that helped find them. That's all coming up next. Finally tonight, SOS by satellite. A group of 10 hikers, all of them teenagers, getting lost with no cell signal. So they turn to a new feature in their iPhone. Miguel Amaguer picks up the story from there. As the sun set in Ventura, California, an urgent call for help. lost in the area. A group of teenagers between 16 to 18 years old getting lost while hiking in Santa Paula Canyon with no cell service, but managing to contact a local rescue team using Apple's new emergency SOS feature. This is our first chance to interface with the new iPhone technology, uh, and it's a game changer, frankly. Um, they were able to use their iPhone to uh, call 911, and it, uh, you know, works through the satellite. The emergency SOS function available on iPhone 14 models uses satellite communication to text critical information to first responders when cell service isn't available. First, you'll provide some information about your situation for emergency services. And you'll see choices to specify your emergency based on your answers. Rescuers unable to get direct radio communication in this canyon. There are no but this group of teens was able to share their location and condition. We knew they were fine. Um, they did the right thing. They hunkered down, sheltered in place, and, and waited for us to arrive. And so that changed uh, the, the search strategy. After an hour and a half hike into the canyon that had recently been damaged by flooding, members of the search and rescue team found them. They were not in necessarily in any immediate danger, but they certainly were not going to get out of there on their own. The rescue combining new technology with old-fashioned common sense. These, these guys did it just right. 
Um, they realized they were lost and they stopped and they hunkered down and they stayed in the same location. They didn't split up. And that makes our job much, much easier. The SOS feature on the iPhone. Good to remember. All right. We thank Miguel for that story. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas right here in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.